Okay, now for something completely different. We've talked about professional sports people, we've talked about fans, we've talked about engagement, but what about a fan that becomes a pro sports person? That's me, and that's my story. And this is what motivated me. This is the Vendée Globe. It's a race that if you are from outside of France, it's probably the biggest sporting event that you've never heard of, sadly. I'm doing my very best to make sure that that changes. It is an absurd race with this kind of boat with one person on it. What is the Vendée Globe? Well, in France, it is a cultural phenomenon. There are two and a quarter million people that go through an otherwise sleepy town on the west coast of Brittany, uh, of not of Brittany, of <laughs> the west coast of France. Two and a quarter million live fans to watch the start and finish of a sailboat race. That could never happen anybody, anywhere else in the world. And yet it happens here in France. It is amazing. And the penetration of this, uh, this sporting event goes beyond just the sport. In 2013, um, in the event before uh, the one that just happened, um, it was the, the Vendée Globe was the second uh, most searched Google term uh, in all of France. Now, this is where we start out. It's an incredible experience. We have the uh, famous uh, channel uh, here, and the boats, they leave from the top, they go snaking down out of the channel and then off into the unknown. And there, are th there were 300,000 people there standing, cheering, clapping as we set off around the world. Let me show you a little bit about what my field of play looks like. So we turn left at Cape Finisterre, we go rushing down the North Atlantic, across the equator, around the anticyclone, turn left when we get to Cape Town, and then dive into the Southern Ocean. Underneath Australia, cuckoo for New Zealand as they go by, through the wastelands of the Pacific. Turn left again at Cape Horn, and then retrace our steps all the way back to the Subdolone. That gives me the chills, just looking at it. And I've done it. <laughs> it's amazing. Now, for the Americans in the room, the Vendée Globe is basically just like NASCAR, because all you do is turn left. <laughs> so, a little bit more about this. Um, the Vendée Globe is often talked about as the Everest of sport, and it is one of the three pinnacles of sailing. There is the America's Cup, there is the Volvo Ocean Race, which used to be the Whitbread, and there is the Vendée Globe. It is an absolute pinnacle event, and is thus often compared to, uh, to Everest. However, since 1953, when um, now Sir Edmund Hillary first climbed that mountain, there have been about 7,000 people that have graced its flanks. 166 people have taken the start of this race. 88 have finished. Now, a demonstration of, of the fact that this is a very uh, Franco-Francais race, um, there are only Europeans, basically, that do this race, and when I, despite all of my challenges that I will explain in, in the coming minutes, managed to finish this race, I became the third non-European finisher and the first Kiwi to do this race. Despite the fact that we have incredible nautical heritage, nobody had ever made the jump to France and to Vendée Globe. Now, I showed you what the field of play looks like from the planetary perspective. This is what my daily life looks like. Now you talk about fan engagement, you talk about taking photos in your stadium. I had one fan of mine who wrote to me and said that she turned off the heat in her house in a, in a northern European winter in order to better live my life. 
the water that's splashing all over the boat there, there are literally tons of it coming over the boat at all times. And it's five degrees Celsius. So it's pretty brutal. <coughs> now, why is typically the question that I get asked the most often. Why on earth would I abandon a safe house, a woman that loves me, a otherwise stable life in order to go solo by myself around the world in an event that took me 110 days to complete. Well, some might call me a lunatic. Some might call me inspired. Um, I say that I'm hyper-motivated to challenge myself to find out what I am capable of achieving. And the reason that the Vendée Globe and this style of racing is such an incredible challenge is that I'm alone, but also I'm alone even before the start of the race goes. I became this kind of sailor I'd because I was watching YouTube videos when I was in Colorado doing my uni university degree in economics. I thought that might be an interesting challenge. And yet, this transformation from, from fan to sailor was very, very complicated because first I had to learn how to become an absolute master of all of the systems on board. I did two races around the world in preparation for this one. I won one of them, I survived another, and um, I became a, a real specialist in my sport. And along the way, I had to scrub the bottom of boats in order to put money on the table. There's no flashy Maseratis in my uh, parking lot. Now, <laughs> this is what my daily life looks like, and it is an incredible challenge. Um, the wind sometimes blows 60 knots, which is more than 100 kilometers per hour. As I said, the sea temperature is down to five degrees. I'm taking packets of water in the face on a daily basis that are so strong that when they hit you in the stomach, they take the wind out of you. Now, clearly I'm a sucker for punishment and I like a big challenge. So how, when I, I have one twentieth of the budget and one fifth uh, of the team of my competitors, how can I complicate my life a little bit further? Well, I do it with solar panels. Now, we often talk about how uh, ecology uh, is, is very, very important. COP21 was notably signed here in Paris. Um, and it's, it's this is, but this is something that I live. I live very, very sincerely um, in, in a way of promoting uh, the, the transfer of our uh, energy infrastructure. Um, I ride my bike to work um, and I power my boat, not with diesel, with, uh, with and all of my competitors take 300 liters of diesel around the, w uh, around the world with them to make their boats run. I do it on solar panels and with a hydro generator. So I had solar panels on, uh, on the rooftop. I had prototype solar panels that were flexible, that were attached to the mainsail. They didn't work for more than five days. That's what prototypes are for. Um, and then crucially, I had an, a, a, um, a propeller underneath the boat um, because I had, during the winter uh, refit of the boat, I had ripped out the diesel engine and the diesel generator, and I replaced it with an electric motor that is kind of like a hydroelectric dam in reverse. Instead of having water uh, rush past a static turbine at the bottom of a hill, I take the boat with a propeller on it and rush that through the water, and that'll generate electricity. Now, why, when I've got all these sails, do I need electricity? Well, I need to run an, auto, uh, an autopilot, um, and, and in fact, the autopilot drives the boat for 90% of the time that I'm at sea because I've got everything else to do. I need to uh, be a journalist. I write all of my own content uh, at sea and send it back over the satellite connections, of which we have three on board. Um, I need to make my own water from the, from the drinking water from the seawater around me because it's lighter to manufacture your own drinking water as you go around the world and to bring it with you. Um, and, and I need to communicate with people. And so in, in this connected age, racing around the world is actually one of the best sports, in my humble opinion, uh, and non-biased opinion, um, for the 21st century. Because this is a race that happens for three months. And so I talk about fan engagement. You want eyeballs on your product for three months, nonstop, 
around the world. And there are people that, um, that download the app, that play the virtual regatta game. So we were talking about eSports earlier. There were nearly 500,000 people that digitally raced me around the world. Sadly, I had many problems, and they beat me, including my, my brother-in-law, and that really irritated me. Um, but anyway, I do um, Skype conferences uh, from the middle of the Southern Ocean with the boat jumping up and down. Um, I even called into a school and um, answered primary school uh, kids' questions like, are there sharks? Am I afraid of the sea? Is there an octopus that's going to attack me? Um, and then I also called into my sponsor uh, and did a live video conference um, with the board of directors. Now, selfie sticks are cool, but drones are better. Um, here at the Science and Sport Conference, we're talking about different ways of telling stories. And um, this boat is 18 meters long. The mast is 30 meters high, so 100 feet. And it's really hard to get the whole boat in one photo, no matter how long your arm is. So um, for the first time ever, I took uh, a consumer photo drone with me, and I flew it with me all the way around the world. Now. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that I took one, I came back with one that was still working, I didn't crash it into the sea, uh, which is extremely complicated because I spoke with a friend of mine who's a helicopter pilot, and he said, in order to fly a helicopter, you have to completely disassociate from what, what one hand is doing from the other. So you need to kind of tap your head and rub your belly at the same time. But for me, that's table stakes, because I had to fly a helicopter, line up the shot, and drive a boat at the same time. And then to get it back, uh, I had to stand on the back of this moving boat that was jumping up and down, and then fly in the, the, the drone towards me and catch it out of media because there's no stable place to land it. Now, sometimes prototypes have consequences. These boats are made out of 10,000 individual components, and if anyone, any piece goes wrong, you're going to have a bad day. This is what happened to me. That's the, uh, the mark of a fire that I had on board. One of the solar controllers that regulated the energy coming out of my solar panels that was charging my batteries blew up. Now, as, uh, as Vincent explained, uh, these boats are made out of carbon fiber and epoxy resin, all of which is flammable. I was in the middle of the South Atlantic, a long, long way away from help. So I managed to put the fire out using a fire blanket, and um, the fire had burned off the insulation on the live cables. And so when I put the blanket over the fire, I both burned my hands and was electrocuted at the same time. Um, and then I heard a beep. And the beep was a short circuit on my autopilot. And then this happened. Man, if you thought you were having a bad day, just look at mine. So that's the boat on its side because it, it completely wiped out. It crashed. Put the wind on the wrong side of the sails. The keel, which swings backwards and forwards, uh, was on the wrong side. And, um, and it really damaged all of my electrics on board, which meant that over the course of the race, 50,000 kilometers, that happened another 15 times, which is a huge nightmare. Um, now, why is that dramatic? Well, because... That's where I work. <laughs> you all, all use Google. Most of you haven't seen your position lined up as that. Now, this is Point Nemo. It is the middle of the Pacific, literally between halfway between New Zealand and Chile, and the Pitcairn Islands and the Antarctic. Now, actually, that's a terrible photo, because this one's better. That's actually where it is. So Point Nemo, at the most isolated place on this planet, 1,500 miles away from anything. To put that in perspective, the astronauts on the International, astronauts on the International Space Station are 300 kilometers away. And they can r pull a ripcord and get home in time for dinner. If I have anything that goes wrong, I'm going to be waiting there for a week. Now, um, I continued on. I made it back, as you saw on the previous uh, video, around Cape Horn, back up the Atlantic, and I thought that the hardest bit was over. I'd made it out of the South Pacific, out of the rigors of the huge waves. 
However, there was more in stock. I went from a boat that looked like that, magistral, exciting, fast, key, fully functional, with a bang. I lost it. 30 tons of pressure in the mast were released in one moment. And I went from a boat that looked like that to one that looked like that. I lost the mast, the whole thing, uh, just off the coast of Portugal. And it, you can see behind me a tube. It's not a piece of the mast, that's the boom. So the boom, this bit here, un underneath the mainsail, that was my get out of jail free card. That was my way home, right? What you can't see behind my left shoulder is the fact that it's smashed. So it's a nine meter long tube that weighs 90 kilos. That's my way home and it's broken. It took me four days of nonstop work to repair that tube, to get it back in one piece, to cut a mainsail out of the shreds that I had left, to redesign a new set of rigging until I could finally step it. Now, during all this four days of work, I had one fear. What if I get it all back in one piece and I can't get it vertical again? Then I'm just going to have invested all of my spares and I still can't go home. I had one shot to get, it, get this right. So in order to, to, um, to lift it into position, I had to put all of the 100 kilos on my shoulder on a rocking boat with unstable footing and I had to try and lift it into position. sucked. <laughs> anyway, that was my first attempt. I, there were several, several, several more. And I finally managed to pick up the boom, put it onto a pile of sail bags, and then I c once the initial angle was created, I could then hoist it back into position from the front of the boat. And I managed to get it to here, which was amazing. However, the maniac that I am, details count, I didn't like the shape of the sail that I just spent four days making and all of the struggles to get it into a vertical position. So what was the first thing I did when I got to that point? Well, I took it down and then made modifications to the sail and then set it back up again. So at this point, I had nearly 800 miles to go. I was off the coast of Lisbon. I was going towards the west coast of Spain, uh, west coast of France, and I had no food. I was late and I was literally out of rations. So I, I found a couple of survival biscuits I, I cut them into tiny centimeter square chunks, and I rationed myself to 700 kilos uh, calories per day for two weeks, and in the process lost 11 kilos until I got to this point. So I crossed the line in 16th position. There were 18 boats that finished out of an initial fleet of 29. I made it home. There were 10,000 people waiting for me on the docks when I arrived. It was one of the most incredible moments of my life because when that mast went over, it wasn't just 30 meters of carbon fiber. That was 10 years of my life of waking up every single day asking myself, what can I do today that'll get me to this moment? And just two days before I was meant to be there, it was all ripped away from me. So I made it home, ran down the pontoon, much to the delight of everybody, um, and then finally made it home. Now, the lesson that I like to transmit from this is that details matter. I made it home in, in what, 110 days, one hour, 58 minutes, and because details count, <laughs> 41 seconds. Um, this was an adventure that took me 10 years to get to, three laps of the globe to, to complete. And I finally made made good my transformation from fan to sportsman. However, this is just the beginning because the next race is in 2020. I want to come back and instead of just surviving it, I want to try and win it. Nobody from outside of France has ever done that. And I want to go from being the first, the first Kiwi, the first person to fly a drone at sea, the first person to girdle the globe 
without burning any uh, any fossil fuels to being the first uh, étranger uh, to win this race. So, dream big. It takes a long time, but I encourage you to live out the most dangerous, wild, possible fantasies that you could ever imagine, because with enough hard work and some dumb luck, you can get there. Thank you.